Today's episode is proudly brought to you by Anfizi. Hello, my name's Rebecca Tapp and welcome to Decoding Purpose. The word purpose has worked its way into part of our everyday vocabulary, not just in business, but also in our personal lives. So where do we begin with such a big concept? And what are some of the steps we can take to explore our purpose and apply it to our lives? In Decoding Purpose, we unlock the minds of on-purpose activists, innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, creatives, spiritual thinkers, and everything else in between. Welcome to the podcast, Decoding Purpose. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Lisa Messenger is a name familiar to most people. However, for those of you who have not heard of Australia's magazine Maverick, Lisa is the game-changing founder and the CEO of The Collective Hub. She is also an international speaker, best-selling author and an authority on disruption in both the corporate sector and the startup scene. Most significantly, Lisa is one of the most purpose-driven women that I know, which is why Lisa has been number one on my podcast wish list for quite some time, and I was so excited to have her in the studio. In 2013, Lisa launched Collective Hub as a print magazine with no experience and in an industry that people said is either dead or dying. Collective Hub has since grown into an international multimedia business and lifestyle platform with multiple verticals across print, digital and events, all which serve to ignite human potential. Now, I'm sure many of you listening today, especially the entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs out there, would have held the Collective magazine in your hands or one of Lisa's many books at a point in time. And if you were anything like me, you would have cut the collective into pieces after reading it and collaged your office or bedroom walls with your favourite inspirational quotes. Lisa's purpose is to be the entrepreneur for entrepreneurs and that she is in every sense of the word. Before recording this interview, Lisa and I were chatting and I was reflecting on the fact that I had met her many years before she famously launched The Collective magazine. We had shared quite an intimate dinner with mutual friends in around 2008. We laughed about how long ago that was. However, upon reflection, it was one of those poignant moments of gratitude because like so many others, I had witnessed the rise of one of Australia's most prominent female entrepreneurs. I remember sitting with Lisa that night and it was nearly impossible to fathom the journey she was about to go on, the evolution of a purpose that we all got to watch in awe from the sidelines, a purpose that was deep, daring, beautiful and bold, but also a purpose that was heartachingly real, raw and required a level of resilience that would break many of us. Despite that In her evolution, Lisa kept it real as the entrepreneur's entrepreneur, even when it hurt, even when it broke, and even when the call of purpose whispered, let's do it again and let's do it differently. Lisa and I covered all of this and more, so as you can imagine, we had a lot of ground to to cover. So much so that we decided to turn the episode of Decoding Purpose into two parts as a celebration of Lisa's brand new book, Work From Wherever, How to Set Yourself Free and Still Achieve, which is available for pre-sale today and will be released next week. Check out the show notes for links to the Collective Hub where you can buy the book. In the first half of my incredibly candid conversation with Lisa, we talked about her personal sense of purpose how she has used adversity to crystallise this. We unpacked some of the trends covered in work from wherever, and we also talked openly about the iteration and constant evolution of the Collective Hub and the part her magazine and team played in setting herself up for brand new ventures. Welcome to part one of Decoding Purpose with Lisa Messenger. 
So welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast, Lisa Messenger. What an honour to have you here with me in the studio today. Thank you. It is an absolute pleasure and honour to be here. I am so excited to have you and, and such a privilege because if there's anyone that I would want to decode purpose with, it's you because your journey has been like such a purpose-driven adventure. <laughs> It sure has. And you just mentioned how many years ago we met. And uh, yeah, it's been a pretty wild ride since then. So let's dig in. Let's dig in. Well, I'm going to start off with a big question. I uh, often hear people talk about being on a journey to find their purpose Mm or even waiting for the point in time that uncovers their purpose. So as a starting point, and this is a question that I actually ask every guest on Decoding Purpose, What are your thoughts on whether purpose is fate or a choice that we make? A bit of both. Um, And we can, I mean, I'm, this is probably one of my favorite topics and I'm extraordinarily clear on my purpose, which is to be an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything is possible. And uh, I believe that will be my purpose until the day I die, but how that um, manifests or the different ways that it comes out are very, um, you know, they, they pivot all the time. So that's a really beautiful thing, but I'm 100% unshakable on what my purpose is. And I discovered it in 2013. So we can talk about, you know, everything retrospectively and in hindsight led to that point um, and, you know, what has happened as a result and the flow that has occurred. But I think the interesting thing about it is, you know, once you land there, it's um, it's been really important for me to be able to reverse engineer it and try and explain to other people, <laughs> decoding purpose, how I actually got there. Because, you know, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge topic, isn't it? <laughs> it's a massive topic. But if you if you go into that moment in time, was it a conscious decision or was it kind of like this universal unfolding where you're like, wow, that was fate? No, it was 100% a uni- universal unfolding and it was fate. But in hindsight, like my entire life, everything from a personal perspective and everything from a business perspective, I mean, I'd had my own businesses for 11 years at the time. And I'd been through a lot personally. And so I could never have realised that what I landed on would have been my purpose. But retrospectively, it all makes perfect sense in its completely illogical, yeah. <laughs> logical way. And I think that is something so important, particularly in this day and age when careers are not linear, life is not linear, things happen to us every single day that are beyond our control – but what we do have control over is how we choose to react and respond and what we do with it. And so one of my biggest messages now is, you know, so many people are like, but I have no idea what my purpose is or how did you get there? And we can talk about, you know, all the ways and reasons that I think that happens. Um, But just know this, that all the pain points and all the, you know, dramatic things that happen in your life and everything that you have to overcome, which at the time might feel like it's, you know, dropping you to your knees and is completely insurmountable and you can't ever see the other way out the other side. I now have a deep inner knowing that it's those points in time that have been without a doubt the most critical um, in my growth and really landing on what my purpose is. And once you learn to reframe that and you get a glimmer of hope and you know you know what can come out the other side because of those lessons it's actually extraordinary so now when horrible things catastrophic things happen to me which they still still do I am able to not be completely overshadowed by it and drowned by it but rather kind of go okay what's in this you know and I know that this too shall pass and that Mm. something will come out the other side. So I think that's probably one of the most important lessons. (laughs) It's And I believe it's one of the most powerful components of purpose and I actually have a few questions to dig in there a little (laughs) more further into the podcast. And dig as deep as you want because there's little that I haven't experienced on some level. So the more you can – I'm happy to go anywhere with this because I think it's only by sharing our own stories – 
that we help each other and lift each other higher. And whilst my story is my story and it's unique to me, there's certain points that people who are listening will be like, oh, that's just like me or that happened to me. And, and you know, I've chosen to share my life out loud. So whatever you want to ask, go for it. <laughs> and what a gift that life is. And you have shared it out loud, which is uh, why it's such a privilege to interview you about purpose because we can, you know, we can really go between the lines. So. <laughs> In, in moving to the next question, so, you know, as you know, the intention of the podcast is decoding purpose. And now I know generally speaking about purpose, we often explain it as the discovery of our why. Yeah. However, what I'm interested to explore is how you define purpose, but going one step further than that, how do you live, embody and experience your purpose? What does it feel like as an energy in motion in your life? Ah, that is a beautiful question and thank you because I think so many people ask the surface questions in life and this is really juicy and gritty good. and good. Um, so, and feeling is everything. I think um, so many people think that a purpose is something like, um, you know, I want to, I don't know, buy a big yacht or I want to buy a huge house or I want to, you know, it's um, certain things that are material and then they don't actually dig into why do I want to do that? Like, because money in and of itself or possessions in and of itself are pretty shallow. But if it's got specific meaning behind it, I want to do this because, I want to do this because this and by this date, then it sends, I think, a very clear message to the universe around what you're actually trying to achieve and what the feeling is. And I mean, there's all these sort of old cliches out there, you know, people say, I'm going to work really hard so I can retire and go fishing all day and things like that. And I'm like, hang on a minute, what's the feeling around fishing all day? Well, I just want to feel content and free and relaxed. And so then Mm. you question, well, why would you work in a nine to five corporate job or whatever it is, slugging your guts out for years, not enjoying it at all in the hope that you might live till 65 so you can actually go and do something which actually doesn't cost a lot of money and you could do right now. And it's like when when you say it like that, it's so simple. But I think people just get caught up in living life according to other people's expectations or, you know, um, this person does that, therefore I should do this. Or, you know, we get caught up in societal norms or the status quo or you know I want a bigger house because you know my neighbor has one or you know it's wrapped up in ego or low self-esteem and a myriad of other things so I think purpose it's really important just to get clear on what's the feeling um why are you here why do you do what you do what's the legacy you want to leave what juices you up and makes you feel alive every day you know and um and people sometimes say to me the work that I'm doing is selfless in a way I would say it's actually quite selfish because giving back and sharing and you know trying to help other people gives me so much freaking satisfaction way more than any money or materialistic Mm. things and um Oh, there's so much we could talk about. But, yeah, let, I'll stop there and you can ask me the next question so I don't start ranting. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think the beautiful thing about what you just said kind of taps into one of maybe the myths about purpose, that it's it's all about giving or it's all about charity or, or it's all external where mm. it's actually something that is this transformative force that kind of comes from the inside out. So yeah. whilst your purpose is giving and it is being selfless, quote unquote, in some ways, it's it's the process of feeling it within and experiencing that transformative force that enables you to be that whilst also stepping into your own potential. That is, I think, the gift of purpose. Yeah, actually, it's a really good point. So I might just um, unwrap a little bit my purpose because um, it also, it's it's interesting when you, how you frame things and how you choose to um define your purpose. So when I say being an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, the first part of that is around, you know, I want to um, experience as much as I can. And then I go, you know, and, and really experience what it is across a number of different industries and modalities and really live it to the full. So the second part is um, living my life out loud. So the third part is showing that anything is possible. So it actually, because I've chosen that, it's a really simple and really beautiful thing for me because it makes me live my best life every single day. So it almost 
in deciding as part of my purpose to share it with the world and inspire others and show them that anything's possible. It's actually making me get off my ass and be like, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'm going to get out there and challenge myself and get uncomfortable and keep trying different things. So it's, um, so, so I would say to anyone, like, make sure that you wrap your purpose in such a way that it also keeps you accountable to your mission. And so mine is just so simple. And so it's really beautiful because as you step into life and things become bigger and bigger or you taste some success, so many opportunities come every single day. And as an entrepreneur or anyone in life who wants to live big, so, you know, for an example, people might say, hey, I want to go into business with you doing I don't know, blah. And I'll be like, oh, my my initial gut reaction is, oh, my gosh, so excited because I get excited and passionate about most things. I choose to live consciously in joy. But then I go, does that actually fit within my purpose? Mm. No, it doesn't. So it's like, thank you very much. That sounds extraordinarily exciting, but I'm going to have to say no. And the power of no when you're on purpose is way more important than the power of yes because otherwise your life becomes busy and, you know, let's not glorify being busy (laughs) and you actually start losing focus of what it is that you're here to do and you start, you know, grabbing at all sorts of different things and before you know it and I've been there and this is why I can say it, you're living this life that actually isn't on purpose and you're actually drowning and you feel like you're, you know, every day not in your genius zone. And so I think it's really important to, you know, stay clear and stay on purpose. Now, people who are listening maybe have not yet found their purpose. And so they're like, oh, it's okay for you. So it would be good to like, at some point, jump into, well, how do you get there? Because I don't want anyone to feel alienated like God, because it took me years I mean took me years and years to understand what I was here to do and stop living life according to other people's expectations and bumbling along (laughs) I was reading um I think it was a quote on on Instagram the other day a likening purpose to a seed and a seed can exist beneath the soil for years and years before it chooses to bloom. And I thought yeah. that's such a beautiful analogy yeah, for purpose and it taps into exactly what you're saying, that it's something that is within us, yeah. but it, it needs the right conditions and it can happen at any time and yeah. um, and that it is there uh, and when it's ready to bloom, it will bloom. And when you're ready. I mean, mm. mine manifested with launching Collective Hub in 2013 and you know, I mean, that was huge. I launched a print magazine in, you know, there were, <laughs> I'd never worked in media. I'd never worked for magazines. Um, there was a highly saturated market, five and a half thousand print magazines in Australia. And there's no reason that it should have ever worked. And within 18 months, the print magazine was in 37 countries and it was a huge juggernaut. But, um, you know, so in hindsight, I was like, wow, gosh, why didn't I do that earlier? Like, it's so obvious. There was such an obvious gap in the market because the magazine was, you know, is for entrepreneurs and telling the story behind the story. And it was in, when I did it and it was so well received, I was like, my gosh, why didn't I do this years before? And in actual fact, and I've talked about this in some of my books, like I, there's no way I was ready for that before. So the universe presents, I think when you're ready, like what it took to start something of that magnitude um, and grow it into such a big global brand. Like it's only because I'd had businesses for 11 years before and so I'd sort of had like a lot of learnings in that time um, so I was ready to step into it. But also personally, I mean, I'd experienced, you know, death and divorce and giving up drinking and a million other things Mm. that prepared me and gone through like 10 years of therapy and, you know, every sort of modality on the planet. And so, you know, by the time I launched Collective Hub in 2013, I was like the the strongest, most resilient, most feminine as well. That's important. We can talk about that duality in terms of purpose. I think that's important. I have a question on that subject. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. Um, You know, I was the strongest version of myself that I have ever been in 2013. And so, I wasn't ready. And um, when I was writing Daring and Disruptive, my first book in the series, which charts the first 18 months of Collective Hub in its infancy, um, it's funny because I looked back and 
I can't remember the details now, but I'd bought a book several years before called How to Start a Magazine. <laughs> and um, my editor reminded me that when we were in Morocco in, I think it was 2007 together, um, I had talked about on a rooftop um, in Morocco about starting a magazine. So all this had been sitting there for a lot of years, but I wasn't ready to step into it. And mm. so that's a big thing about purpose as well. Like you might have this and this underlying feeling or the seed, as you said, for years and years, and suddenly it'll just be right. So I think people shouldn't be too hard on this themselves because when it, when you hit it, it becomes so obvious, and you know it's just part of your destiny. But um, but you you have to be ready, like really ready for it. Mm. I could keep going down this <laughs> tangent of conversation, <laughs> but I'm going to dive into my next question. Mm. But there's so much to talk about here. I've, um, over the last week or so, I've immersed myself in all of the podcasts you've recorded uh, over the last last year or so to really get a sense of your journey. So today in a true messenger style, rather than starting at the beginning of your journey, I wanted to do a flip and start into the future and work backwards. Okay. <laughs> So in a recent interview, you mentioned that your next project, dream or adventure will be, on, will be beyond the beyond. <laughs> so we now live in a world being redefined by AI, robotics, cryptocurrencies mm. and, and the li- list goes on. Mm. Uh, the collective purpose is to ignite human potential yes. and yours is to be the entrepreneur's entrepreneur. Yes. So while I understand that you may not be ready to reveal your next grand project, although I'm sure we're all dying to know, <laughs> uh, what are your broader thoughts with regards to the intersection of igniting human potential, purpose, and the ever-evolving landscape of the future economy? So this is interesting because I was on stage yesterday at Vivid um, talking about this very topic, which um, and it, it was interesting. The, the topic was um, what does the workplace look like in 2029, so 10 years from now. And I was sitting with um, some of the smartest people in this country, um, the head of Facebook and Adam Jacobs, who is the co-founder of The Iconic, and um, Dr. Katrina Wallace, who has Flamingo AI, um, and a guy who has um, who has driverless cars um, in Australia. So, and me, <laughs> and um, gosh, there there is a lot here because I think the future is going to be so different to what we're currently experiencing, and we're kind of in its infancy at the moment, and. I think, um, you know, truly anything is possible. I mean, we're moving at such a rapid pace with, as you say, AI and robotics and, um, you know, machine learning and all that kind of thing. And I think it's really important that we continue to educate ourselves ongoingly because, you know, a lot of jobs will be made redundant. A lot of the way that we do things will change completely. And I think it is extraordinarily frightening. Um, So because these guys yesterday who were much more at the forefront of it than I am are talking about how it's pretty much the Wild West. I mean, entrepreneurs are so far ahead of governments and regulations and so there's a whole lot of things that are happening at the moment that are totally not regulated. And, um, and, you know, that could have all sorts of societal implications and all like all sorts of things. Um, However, I think as long as we're conscious and we humanise things and we're really aware of um, how we're moving forward and I think that very much comes down to the individuals because it's sure as hell not going to be governments Um, and we take responsibility about that next conversation and where the future is going and we embrace it, then I think it's really exciting. As for me, for what's next, it's interesting and I will talk about, we've talked a little bit about purpose in retrospect and I'll talk about my purpose moving forward. And this is probably one of the single most important things I'm going to say in this interview. So many people, um, I talk to corporates all the time and um, so many of them are not, their purpose is not attached to feeling, as I said. And so with things moving so quickly um, with technology, if they're attached to, I don't know, what's in front of us, a chair, um, you know, and they're attached to, I produce a chair, that is what my purpose is, that is what we do 
then what happens? Bit of a ridiculous situation. But if we're all on flying carpets in six months, and actually on the back of the conversations last night, uh, yesterday um, when I was talking to Vivid, a lot of it is about you know autonomous cars and flying mm. cars and all that sort of thing. So the thing is, people some need, of those things are already happening. Yeah. So but, yeah. I think in terms of purpose, it's really important to attach it to a feeling. So, so when I started Collective Hub. Collective Hub, as you said, is about igniting human potential. If it was attached to a print magazine, which I have pretty much closed, 53 issues in, I mean I may do one or two a year, but because I choose to now, not because I have to, then the entire business would have gone under. But luckily from the start I was like, we're about igniting human potential. So it actually becomes then irrelevant how we deliver that. So it doesn't matter if it's a print magazine or a podcast or I'm speaking on stage or writing a book or doing a big tech play or doing a myriad of other things using the latest technologies. And I think that that is one of the most important things I would say. When you come up with your purpose, make it about the feeling and what you're wanting to do in your life or give back in the world, but don't make it about mm, the actual what's the product aspiration? or the actual delivery mechanism because that is going to be changing faster than any of us could ever imagine. So um, with the next iteration of Collective Hub and what I'm doing, um, I'm doing a number of different things, but for now I'm kind of playing. So um, I'm working on two startups at the the moment, but both Exciting. of them 100% on purpose in terms of igniting human potential and being an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs. And that's what I love about your journey is, <laughs> is igniting human potential <laughs> has, and being an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs has played out in so many different ways. And that's a beautiful thing. And yeah. Um, I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about one of the things, I mean, there's a lot of things, but one of the startups I've um, purposely chosen the most ridiculous product I could possibly think of. And um, my boyfriend was like, oh, my goodness, you don't want to be known for that. And I was like, "Uh aha, but I do. Because in and of itself, when he looked at the product, he was like, oh, my, what the? But you got to think bigger than that. The reason I've purposely chosen a ridiculous product is that actually I'm going to tell the entire story about the product from ideation to um, how did I, you know, find it's a it's an actual product. So how did I find a factory? How did I, you know, come up with the idea to produce it? How did I look at, you know, sustainability factors? How do I actually market it? How do I distribute it? So actually, the more ridiculous the product, the more on purpose I am because so many people say to me, well, it's okay for you now. You've got this huge brand or, you know, you know what you're doing in business. So I've chosen something um, in an industry that I know nothing about purposefully. So I can say, well, actually, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna have a red hot go again yeah. at doing this and I'm going to document the entire journey so that I can prove, okay, I'm going to set myself a challenge, you know. Again, it, it keeps life interesting. So that's one um, startup that I'm doing and I'm having a lot of fun because I'm just learning something about this entirely new industry that I knew nothing about and most days I feel completely ridiculous and out of my depth again and that's fun and it's fun because I'm charting the journey for others. <laughs> do you now have a process for, how do I put it, doing the naive? I mean, given you you had never launched a print magazine before and now you're doing it all over again, is there a process attached to that? I mean, there's a lot of um, inherent learnings from you yeah. know so many businesses, but I mean, oh, to give you a small hint, it's in fashion, but you'll be surprised when I come out with it because it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, I've been interviewing fashion designers, and honestly, I feel like such a um, such a <laughs> an imposter, really. So parts of it, yes, a hundred percent. I mean, I believe any business venture, it you know, you come up with the idea, you work up you know, how am I going to fund this? You, you know, um, you come up with the product development, you work out a marketing plan, you know, like it's, it's kind of, there is a flow to it. Um, it's about a 10 to 12 part flow that every single business, it doesn't matter if you're producing, I don't know, orange juice or like some tech, whatever it is, yes. it's pretty much, um, I'm only saying orange juice because it's in front of me, um, but it pretty much follows the same flow. So yeah, in terms of running a business and knowing how to you know, set up budgets and, you know, you know, Gantt charts and timelines and all that stuff. That I know like how to do it. Yep. Um, 
but fashion I know nothing about. I mean, we've interviewed a lot, a lot pretty much every fashion brand, you know, in Australia and around the world. But, um, yeah, but for me it's, it's, it's a whole new world. So, But I'm loving the journey. Um, but longer term, I mean, really my thing is I'm going to probably set up an incubator and, um, and invest in a lot of different startups and support people and, you know, track their journeys and share their journeys with the world. So that's part of it, but who knows? I'm not, you will know, I say this a lot. Um, I'm detached from specific outcomes and I surrender to the process. And I think that is really important because, if you're fixed on I'm going to do this in five years and it's a thing like I'm going to start a magazine in five years, well, it's very limiting because who knows how else your purpose may unfold, you know. So I try and stay in flow as much mm. as possible. And I think it's another beautiful example of staying anchored in that one clear purpose mm. but allowing that to feather out in lots of different beautiful ways and, and being open to the art that the universe brings in that process. Yeah. Yeah. And you just describe that beautifully. And it's, um, there is definitely an art because it's about having purpose and staying focused. I mean, that's really, focus is a really important one. Um, and staying true to that purpose by staying focused, but also, um, being able to be malleable and let it feather out, as you said, in other ways, but, um, but not in too many ways. I mean, collective <laughs> at one point I was like, we've got 17 different revenue streams. And, you know, that was getting a little too feathery. <laughs> So this this part of the conversa- conversation brings me beautifully to my next question. You're obviously someone who has an innate ability to, within your mind's eye, sit on the edge of the future as you see it. And that is an epic superpower for any entrepreneur. I also believe that our purpose and our ability to envision that purpose is also something that sits on that edge. And it is, it is our ability to see the future and that possibility that drives the action to make it real. Yeah. So what processes or I guess spiritual practices have you used to fine tune your ability to scan the future in order to, to visualize your next creation or your next adventure? Yeah, it's a great question. And anyone who is an entrepreneur or a big thinker might understand this. My inside my head is like, um, I'm very visual. First and foremost, I'm like extraordinarily visual. So my head looks like a million different circles and I can kind of see. Mind map things. Yeah, (laughs) but it's almost more than seeing it. It's almost an inner knowing and a feeling about possibility. And I also um, draw, so I'm mostly working out of home now. We can talk about why I'm doing that. Um, downstairs we have three massive glass doors and I literally have drawn all over them. So I bring try and bring my um, thought patterns and mind maps out into physical space and I also all day, every day write like I have massive big white blank notepads and I scribble like I'm drawing circles and mind maps all the time for every iteration of um, businesses and ideas and things I see, I need to get them out of my very combobulated head. <laughs> you know, those um, Instagram memes, like how many tabs do you have open at once or whatever. I have yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, so I do that. And it's also um, frustrating sometimes as someone who's a very, very big thinker and can say things that happen first because then I try and articulate it to someone and I can almost get quite snappy with them because I can see it so clearly. I don't even... It's just so obvious. Yeah, but I don't always know exactly how I'm going to step into it. I just know I will. Like I have such an innate inner knowing now. And so sometimes I'll try and be like, oh, yeah, this, this, and someone will be like, but why? How is that? I'm like, oh, it just is. (laughs) I haven't always... I know exactly where I'm going in a way but I, I I know the why I don't necessarily know the how and the steps to get there but once you hold it very closely and you um in my experience draw it out or have some kind of vision board or something in front of you you don't actually need to worry about the how it just happens and I know that sounds a bit woo-woo but I know it to be 100 mm. percent true like the most extraordinary things happen. Actually, I talk about it in my book, Purpose, and I was saying it to Tegan this morning who has recently started working for me. For ages, um, 
in my office, I had a big red, a picture of a big red box sitting on my glass wall in, in the middle of the mind map. And people used to say, and I just wrote red box. And people used to be like, what is that? I was like, I don't know yet, but it's it's the next iteration of what I'm doing. And um and I wasn't taking notice of it. And one day on the Anzac Bridge, driving into the city in Sydney, I literally like this is the weirdest thing. A red box was in the middle of the road and I hit it and it got stuck under my car all the way home to Darlinghurst, which is, I don't know, quite a few kilometers and a good ten minute drive. And this whole thing's like scraping along the bottom of the road. Yeah, I'm through like, the oh my God. city tunnel. And yeah. um some things happen like that and it's a big like woo woo opening, but it's so weird. As soon as I've drawn something and articulated it, it comes in the weirdest of ways. Um so it's so weird. I can't even explain it. But what I can what I can say is I'm very big on meditating visualizing, you know, vision boarding, writing things out. And it doesn't have to be, and it never is, by the way, the actual plan. It's the feeling around it or where I think I want to go. And then it just happens. Mm. Danielle Laporte does some beautiful work around that, doesn't she? She, Yeah. She's amazing. And yeah, her and I spent some time together last year. Um, Yeah. And yeah, she's been very supportive and yeah, we have yeah, we have a good mutual respect, but she's extraordinarily tapped into all of this. Yeah. Beautiful. So many people listening to this podcast would be aware of the incredible birth breaking and now remaking (laughs) of the collective hub. The evolution has been one that from the sidelines I've been in awe of. Mm. And as I move through my questions today, we will begin to unpack a little more of that journey and the evolution of yours and the collective purpose. However, right now you're about to release your new book work from wherever yes how exciting <laughs> I know all the uh, all the Lisa Messenger fans will be out there waiting to get their copy uh, so look I actually have two questions uh now correct me if I'm wrong but I would imagine like most of your books work from wherever is a direct reflection of of where you are right now yes so with that in mind, what have you learned about the freedom experienced of living your purpose from wherever, mm. opposed to being locked down, heading up a massive empire? Thank you. Such a good question. Um, and yes, you're right. What have I done? Seven books in the last five and a half years, because I, as part of my purpose, I was like, well, like, if I'm going to be living my life out loud, then I need to uh, write books in real time and share everything, the good, the bad, the ugly and the amazing. And um, two of the seven have been <laughs> the ugliest sides <laughs> of life. But this one is beautiful and I'm very proud of it. Um, so what I would say is, and it's it's so around purpose, it's like I stepped in 2013 so wholly into my purpose, like something beyond anything I could ever, 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 ever have imagined and um, and that manifested in a way that, you know, Collective Hub the Print Mag was in 37 countries and we were growing across um, the digital space and also events. You know, we're running often four events a week in multiple cities and, you know, it was a big global business. And what happened was I became increasingly unhappy. <laughs> and so this is um, almost at odds because you would think as you step further and further into your true purpose and – you know, I, I was just so happy and elated every single day. But I am a visionary and a creative and, you know, a big, deep thinker and I love creating and moving forward. And suddenly I had this very big global team and a big bricks and mortar office and a lot of very big overheads, um, you know, a lot of full-time staff, a very expensive office and all this kind of thing. And I was becoming un- increasingly unhappy because I was hemorrhaging money um, we didn't have the right systems and processes in place for a high growth global business. Um, and so it became very much, well, my role became very much around operational. So IT, HR, you know, finance, legal, and, you know, I just I hate that stuff. And so every day I was just drowning. And it also became about um, needing more money to pay for this, you know, every day, mm. every day without fail, the figure was, my CFO would say to me, we need another hundred grand. I mean, that was the minimum she ever said every day. So every day I had to hustle my ass off and like 
find, I mean, I'm very creative and I would, you know, but every day I'm like, oh, do we run another event? Do we launch a podcast? Do we do that? Like, so I was every day having to come up with, like having to come up with creative ideas without the time and space to really feel into them. Mm. And, um, and I just found that incredibly tough and uh, I was constrained and like, to be honest, I went home most days and just like cried on the bathroom yeah. floor. <laughs> and so my message around that is that um, bigger isn't better and, um, you know, really watch or know what you're, where you're best in your genius zone. And mm. mine is about being free and being rebellious. Like I'm freaking rebellious and I love breaking stuff and I love um, m- like entering highly saturated industries and disrupting and taking risks and, couldn't you know when you're in this operational thing you just can't do that so I decided um you know well it's well documented in my last book risk and resilience (laughs) um that I just broke it was just like this feeling inside me was I'm so on purpose my purpose never changed but I've like I've got to break break everything I just kept saying I've got to break everything I didn't know exactly what that meant except Basically, it meant cut the absolute guts out of the business, like get rid of all the cost base so that I wasn't just drowning in operations every day and I could have space just to feel again and go, okay, let's rebuild. And that takes a huge, huge inner knowing and an unwavering self-belief and a knowing that because there's a lot of like potential identity and ego wrapped up in something so big and global to at which by the way and so much of your identity yeah well yeah <laughs> and also yeah. the brand from a consumer or community perspective was growing like and legitimately i mean the magazine was um getting ranged in more stores than ever mm. it was making more money than ever um our events were growing bigger than ever but it was actually the digital part of the business that nearly sank me because in my naivety i didn't know enough about that and i believe you need to be the brand architect you need to know at a grassroots level how something operates before you can put a team in place and let them fly and in that section of the business I just put a team in place, very costly team without understanding it myself. And so, um, yeah, that was the bit of the business that nearly sank us. So I just had to have this, yeah, identity because that's a big thing. From an external perspective, it was growing and growing and looking more and more amazing. And so for me to then come out and say, I'm breaking it all. But that's, um, I've done two courageous things in my life. One was, I mean, I've done many, but one was starting the brand and that was extraordinarily courageous. And the other was, um, you know, break it, having the courage to break it. Mm. Because when you've got something so big to know within myself, it doesn't matter. I need to let it burn to the ground. And I know 100% I can do this again, but in a much better, more sustainable, beautiful, authentic way. Not authentic. I've always been authentic. That's not the right word. Um, but in a way that's actually going to serve me and our community much better. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, my next question uh, is actually going to tap into that. However, today I'm actually journeying back through your book titles and exploring <laughs> purpose uh, through each theme presented in each book. But I have a few more questions about your current book before, yes. <laughs> before doing that. Um, so my next question with regards to work from wherever is, do you think that as more and more people activate purpose Mm. and step into the creation of purpose driven lives, that the concept of flexible working travel and ultimately freedom in our professional lives will be a trend that redefines how we work today and into the future? 100%. And I love that, um, It's no longer just a trend. I think it's actually happening. People are more consciously choosing careers or ways of working that um, have more meaning and purpose and, um, you know, they're questioning more about how is this impacting the planet and, you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, I met with uh, one of the guys from The Iconic today and, I mean, they've just done something, you know, big um, online fashion store and they've just launched something called Considered, which is extraordinary and um it's basically looking at um five main pillars so that people can shop 
by values. And so, you know, are you interested in vegan or are you, are you interested in sustainability? Are you interested in fair trade? Is it is a sense of community important to you? And that excites me so it excites much. Excites me so much. And um, you know, and and then when I was talking to them and digging deeper into it, I mean, they've they've noticed because they've got all the analytics and you know real time data about how are people shopping now and. It's beautiful to see that more and more people are actually shopping by values. And so I think it's amazing for brands like that to actually, you know, lead the way consciously and kind of go, well, um, you know, let's let's offer people that choice. Because I think words like sustainability or, you know, eco-friendly or whatever are thrown around, but do people actually know what that means? I mean, I hear the words vegan leather thrown around a lot. Well, Vegan is not actually leather. So it's like it's about an education process. But, uh, yeah, so I think definitely people are choosing more and more consciously, you know, uh, who they work for, where they work. Um, But also, you know, work is a thing we do. It doesn't have to be a place we go. So I think the flexibility is amazing. And I know with Collective Hub, so many of the articles we did over the years were about um, you know, how to be a digital nomad or how to have a side hustle. And so that also contributed to my decision to break everything because I was like, well, why are we coming into a physical mm. office every day? I mean, my editor, Amy, has been working from Kayama for two and a half years. I interviewed and- Amy for the podcast, ah. actually. <laughs> yeah, we spoke to Amy um, on episode three. Amazing. Yeah. So she... Um, you know, she hasn't. She wasn't even one of my full time thirty two staff. Yet she was running the magazine from Kayama. And my IT guy Kevin's been with me. I don't know, eleven or twelve years. He's never been on the payroll. Like he is. He's always been remote. My bookkeeper Kate, who's been with me eleven years, maybe she lives in the Blue Mountains. Like so, I started realizing that. So many, and Jody, my logistics and distribution person. Like, anyway, so many of my team who I've relied on so heavily for some of them 10 plus years have never actually worked in the office or been full time on my my payroll. And also, of all my staff, um, there were only three people within my big full time team that were actually writers or commissioning writers. And all of our writers have always been freelance. So I was kind of like, well, what's the point of this? Like, I'm having a full-time office in Surrey Hills, paying, you know, nearly 300 grand a year in office expenses plus, 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 plus is very prohibitive because I'm kind of relying on the fact that the majority of the pool of good talent in the world is like within a 10K radius of Surrey Hills. And I was like, well, how ridiculous. Like I want great specialists and they could be located in New York or Bangladesh or like anywhere around the world. They could be from any geographic location, any, you know, ethnicity. And I just thought, you know, why not create a completely borderless business and let people work from wherever they want and make it based on output rather than bums on seats. And so now my team is probably bigger than ever, but um, we don't have a fixed office and uh, it's all based on budgets and KPIs and output. So, yeah, I'm much happier. My team are loving it because they can go to the beach all day if they want as long as they're delivering mm. the work. So I think it's there's a huge change coming, not just for entrepreneurs and um, solopreneurs and digital nomads, but, I mean, very much so for corporates as well. What I love about that model through the lens of purpose yeah. is that all of a sudden you have a team of people who are living their own purpose. They're freelancers. So they're yeah. living to their own dreams, their yeah. own potential. So rather than trying to make people fit to an organisational purpose. Yeah. You've got people who are living their purpose but coming together in in sort of one united dream or yeah. purpose yeah. in order to be able to, to facilitate what you need for the business. Yeah. There's a beautiful alignment about that. Well, it's really important to me because I've gotten very clear on, you know, not just my purpose but my day-to-day, like how do I want to live, what do I want my ideal day to look like, what's important to me, what are my priorities and I mean, my partner, my family, my friends, you know, actual human connection and relationships are really important. Nature is a massive one for me and exercise, health, you know, and it was like at what cost when you're in an office all the time? And also we all work at different um, times of the day and, you know, people have kids and they want to do pickups. And so 
I think in this day and age, it's beautiful for me to step into my purpose, but also enable my team to have that freedom and flexibility. So, um, I mean, it takes, gosh, it takes a lot to get your head around that. I mean, if you had have talked to me about this two years ago, I would have been like, are you on crack? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of, you know, trust and all sorts of other things and also a lot of discipline and more rituals and routines than ever to suddenly go from an office environment where you have a purpose every Mm. day. You know, um, you know, you get your coffee at 8 o'clock, you turn up to the office at 8.30, whatever it happens to be, you high-five all your mates. Like you know where you're meant to be every day and it gives you a sense of purpose and being in the world. And suddenly you're like, oh, well, do I wear my Ugg boots? <laughs> so you've got to, you know, get very clear on your purpose and put in place rituals and routines to support that purpose. So um, for anyone who li- who's listening thinking, oh, that sounds great, you know, it comes with a caveat that you really have to um, you really have to step into it very consciously. So I want to share a paragraph uh, featured in Work From Wherever, taken from your Nomad Manifesto. Ah, yes. <laughs> because I think it captures the evolution of purpose, which is really what I'm wanting to unpack today. The quote is, my message is consistent and my purpose has not changed, but the delivery mechanism and the way I choose to work is a continually moving feast. Talk to me about the art of anchoring in one clear purpose, yet at the same time allowing that purpose to transform. And we might have tapped into this a little bit earlier in the conversation. So, Yeah, we touched on it. I mean, it's it's again what I kind of said about um, knowing wholeheartedly what your purpose is but not being attached to the delivery mechanism. Yeah. So it's um, – even if it's a product, I mean, because it's kind of easy in a way sometimes if it's, let me think. Um, yeah, it's just about being able to think about how does this show up in the world. So, okay, so say someone's a hairdresser. They might think, well, what do I do every day? I physically do someone's hair, therefore I need to go to a hair salon. I'm making this up on the fly, by the way. <laughs> um, so if they just think about that in terms of what they're doing, then – it's going to be quite a linear career and it's always going to have them, um, you know, geographically in one place. But then if you start to think about, well, why do I do what I do and what's my purpose? And you suddenly realise, well, actually what I love is I love seeing the smiles on people's faces when they get a beautiful hairdo. So then it's like not necessarily about the hairdo. So, you know, so or I love educating people and watching them when I show them how to curl their hair and I can see that they get so much joy in that and they, I want to empower them to do it themselves. So then suddenly you start to see, well, what do I want in my life? Like so this hairdresser might say, well, actually I'm sick of going to work like six days a week, you know, eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. I want to have freedom and flexibility. So then maybe they go, ah, well, maybe I go into the salon X amount of times a day But maybe actually it's about creating content and maybe I start to create some, you know, digital courses or I start to create a podcast or I start to like show people how to do their own hair and I start to empower them because I can still bring smiles to their faces. I can still make them excited and feel happy. Uh, It's still commercial for me, but actually it allows me to travel the world a little bit while I'm doing that or it allows me to spend time with my kids. So I think people would need to stop thinking so much around from a one-dimensional, geographically, you know, stuck place and start to think about, well, what about my job or my role do I love? What excites me and what brings joy to other people and also what is commercial about that? And then you kind of go, well, actually, no, I, traditionally a hairdresser is bricks and mortar, but actually yeah, maybe I can move this online a little bit or maybe there's other ways to do this. Maybe I want to travel the world so I'll be a hairdresser to an influencer or, you know, there's lots of ways it can play out. And so I um, would love people to start exploring and playing with, you know, three things. What do I love doing? What makes me feel alive? Um, You know, what are other people saying that they love about me? You know, because if you start to listen to that external validation piece, you'll be like, yeah, I'm actually really good at that. And then the third piece of that is what's commercial? Like what's actually going to help me to pay the bills and live. (laughs) So I think that's kind of easy. 
So we can pre-order work from wherever at yes. the Collective website? Yeah, collectivehub.com. Excellent. <laughs> and, and when's the book out? Uh, it's it's officially in bookstores on the 15th of July, but I think if people pre-order, they will be, we'll have them on the 1st of July, so they should get them two weeks before they're in bookstores. So, And I'm going to sign all the pre-orders, as I always do, which Yay. takes me a long time, but I'm like... Um, That's personal touch. <laughs> yeah, I think that. it's important. And as I do that, I also try and do it really consciously because I know for ages I was like, oh, I'll just sign books and you sit there signing a few thousand books. And now every single time I do one, I'm like, I try and breathe into it like and be conscious about it because I'm like, I don't want it just to land and be like, oh, yeah, it's just signed because I know that means so yeah. much to people. A little bit of intentional <laughs> Lisa magic yeah. on every I book. Can, yeah, sometimes I kiss them. I get quite like I try <laughs> and actually, even though it's quite a mundane task, I really try and do it very consciously and send some like love out there. <laughs> What an incredible interview with the extraordinary Lisa Messenger. Now, that was part one. Next week, we will be dropping part two of Lisa's interview on the Decoding Purpose podcast. And in the meantime, jump on to the Collective Hub website and pick up your copy of Work From Wherever. See you next Tuesday. Thank you for joining us on Decoding Purpose. I'm excited to announce a partnership that I am personally so passionate about. And that partnership is with Ambezi. Ambezi are a brand new tech platform and they are connecting entrepreneurs and business people who have amazing stories to share with the next generation. So the way Ambezi works is it connects entrepreneurs with local schools and local universities and the intention is to inspire, educate and activate purpose and passion for the next generation. All you need to do to give one hour is log on to www.ambezi.com.